surviving infidelity. Wife of five years cheated and now I feel absolutely nothing for her, and that scares me. With updates. Original post. Seven years ago, my wife, Wendy, 32 female, and I, 34 male, met through friends. After dating for two years, we tied the knot, marking five years of marriage. Following my completion of law school, I dedicated myself to a demanding workload as an associate at my firm, logging 60 hours per week during the initial two years of our marriage. That effort paid off and I'm doing well professionally. Wendy was a teacher at a private school, but as soon as we got married, she quit so she could go back to school for her master's in education and is currently in an educational doctoral program while working part-time. This was a bit of a financial strain since I wanted to pay off my student loans as quickly as possible but we managed. My wife had an old laptop that she was using when we started dating. I found it in a box in a closet. She said it crashed and wouldn't work any longer. I plugged it in, tried to turn it on nothing. When we met, Wendy took pictures of everything, primarily selfies of her with others. Knowing that she must have had some pictures of us from that time, I yanked the hard drive and looked at it. It seemed okay, the problem must have been somewhere else. Wanting to surprise her with pictures of when we first started dating, I waited until she left to go visit her sister before I plugged it into a set of cable connector to my PC. There were pictures there, plenty of pictures. Some were of us on dates, laughing, smiling. They brought back some good memories, but there were also others of her with different people. One person in particular I remembered, his name was Bob, and Wendy had dated him before me. There were lots of pictures of her and Bob. I wanted to grab only our pictures, so I thought the easiest way would be to organize them by date figuring the latest pictures would be of only us. But when I clicked them by date, a lot of her pictures with Bob were jumbled up with pictures of us. I began to open the pictures one by one and notice that in a few of her pictures with Bob, where they were cuddling and kissing, she was wearing a necklace, a locket that I had given her as a birthday present in the second year we were dating. I had to borrow the money from my brother to buy it. I looked at the dates on the pictures, and a pattern emerged. On the days and weekends, when school required my undivided attention, the times when she went to her mother's house or her sister's house to give me peace and quiet. She was meeting up with Bob behind my back. I was furious. It felt like fire ants were chewing on my brain, my heart, and my guts. I wanted to punch through the walls, but then something snapped and I went numb. I began to see and think in very cold, analytical terms. I copied all of her pics, all of them, not just those I'd seen, to a flash drive. I packed a bag, grabbed some suits, took the thumb drive, and went to stay with my brother across town. I left her laptop hard drive plugged into my PC with a picture of her kissing Bob on the monitor. The only note I left behind was a sticky note with an arrow on it pointing to the necklace, lock it. Wendy tried to call me from her mother's house, if that's where she really was, but I didn't answer. It wasn't until a few hours later, after she presumably got back to her apartment and saw the picture on the monitor that she blew up my phone with voicemails and texts. I ignored them all. I've already met with another associate who works in the family law department about separation and divorce. We have no children or real property, since a lot of our money went to paying off my loans and for her tuition. My firm has circled the wagons around me, so her calls go to voicemail. She's not allowed onto the property, security already turned her away. Wendy tracked me down at my brother's house, but he made it clear to her on the phone that if she tries to come over, he'll set his Dobermans on her. He told me she was screaming, sobbing, and begging on the phone. It didn't make me sad or happy or anything. I felt nothing. My marriage is over. I've accepted that, but it's been two days, and I still feel nothing. No pain, no anger, nothing. How is it possible that I have no more feelings for her? No desire to ever see her again? No desire to reconcile? Now that I'm alone with my thoughts, feeling this nothing for her scares me. Is this going to last? Am I still in shock? Am I permanently broken? The upside is that I've never seen clearer solutions in my cases. Now for the top advice before reading the first update. I am sorry, man. This happened to you. A good thing is that you found out before any children involved. I'm not going to lie, man. I would do the same thing and never look back. Though I think eventually you will meet with her and her sob story. I was lonely. It was nothing. I realized I love only you. Etc. A person capable of hurting you that way worth not another second of your life. As for feeling nothing, it's the shock of finding out that the person you love never existed. It's a self-defense mechanism that, unfortunately, will wear off, and the pain will come. Shield yourself with loved ones to get through it, mourn her, then, like she died, and move on to someone worthy. I was lonely. It was nothing. You know, to me, this is even worse. 
To cheat on your partner and break their heart over a supposedly meaningless fling would hurt me more than if my significant other fell in love with someone else because sometimes feelings catch you by surprise and that euphoria is hard to resist. Disclaimer. Cheating is bad, no matter what. I'm not excusing it in any way. The opposite of love isn't hate. It's indifference. As a fellow lawyer, I understand how hard the work-life balance can be. At least, you should be able to make a clean break and move on. The lack of hate or anger isn't necessarily a bad sign for you or your future relationships, just your current marriage. All the best. The opposite of love isn't hate. It's indifference. The truth. Just stop caring about them. Hate shows that you have them on your mind. But indifference makes their existence blur away. It's only been two days. Maybe you are still in shock. Best advice at this point would be individual counseling. Good luck. This, but also having experienced something similar myself. A lot of our ideals about who our partner is as a person shape our feelings for them. When you find out something that completely shatters that ideal, it's like the person you love stops existing, never existed. And the person left in front of you is a total stranger. It's been six years since my nine-year relationship ended, and I still have not cried over it. There was a small window where I missed them, about eight months out, but it was only because dating was an emotional pain in the neck, and I missed the stability and the distance started to rebuild some of those false ideals. Luckily, I did not entertain that rabbit hole, and my life is so much happier than I ever was before with that partner. Now for the first update. First, let me thank everyone for your replies. I'm overwhelmed by the positive responses and want to thank everyone who's experienced the same numbness for sharing with me. It helps to know that it's a normal response. I'll look into individual counseling in the near future. The associate at my firm handling my case, let's call her Gail. Reviewed the other pictures on the flash drive and found quite a few where Wendy is cuddling slash kissing Bob, and the engagement ring I gave her is easily discernible. When I was told this, I didn't feel any pain or anger, only elation. I smiled, oddly enough. I asked Gail why this awful news made me happy. She said that it's because it vindicates every action I've taken since I left. I've been in no contact with Wendy, and all communications have been through Gail except for her family and friends who mistakenly think my brother and his wife will be a sympathetic ear. They're not. Gail's already prepared a separation agreement and scheduled a meeting with Wendy on Thursday afternoon. Gail made it clear to Wendy that if she isn't represented by counsel, then I won't be attending. A word about Gail. I can't post her firm nickname, but let's just say if you think Pit Viper, you get the right idea. I'm glad she's on my side. We'll be filing the petition for divorce shortly. Gail believes any spousal support will be minimal and end quickly. As she said, I'll likely get stuck paying the rent for the next five months until our lease ends and Wendy completes the last of her doctoral courses. The only significant asset we have is the account with our savings for a down payment on a house, but it's a dual signature account with no ATM access. Thank you, long forgotten bank guy, for suggesting that as an extra security measure against fraud. My sister-in-law went over to my apartment when Wendy was supposed to be at her part-time job to grab more of my clothes and personal items. She ended up listening to Wendy for a couple of hours. The Redditor who said Wendy would straight up lie about pretty much everything nailed it. The whole time sister-in-law was packing up my stuff, Wendy was telling one easily provable lie after another. Getting nowhere, Wendy asked sister-in-law, isn't there a guy in your background that just gets inside your head and you can't say no? So I guess that's my answer to why she cheated. Bob is a jetty, and Wendy is weak-minded. By the way, sister-in-law did answer her question. Yes, I married him. Spending time with my brother's family has kept me from feeling isolated. My nephews are crushing me in video games, and I'm enjoying every second of it. Work's going great, and the partner who oversees my department stopped by to tell me that he's really proud of how I haven't let this personal issue negatively affect my work. Well, that's it for now. Thank you everyone that replied with supportive posts. I can't explain how much it helps to know I'm not the only one to go through something like this or the apathy I feel toward my soon-to-be ex. Now for some top comments before reading the final update. Sister-in-law's answer crushed it. You're big time. Congrats, man. Glad your firm stood by you. Excellent blindsided regrouped plan of action. Pulled the rip cord and safe landing. Besides your career, go do what you always wanted to do. Learn to fly, sailing lessons, sailplane lessons, scuba diving, kiteboarding, race car driving lessons. You will meet new and interesting people while learning and having fun. Congratulations on achieving apathy towards your wayward wife. That is the state of being to aim for when ditching a cheater. 
Some of us have struggled for years to achieve the Zen of Meh. It appears that you are the anti-manipulation Jedi Master. Great job, and good riddance to her. And now for the second and final update. When he found a lawyer, Todd, Gail and I met with him on neutral ground at another firm. We all had to wear masks due to COVID, which made it look like we were there to rob the place or something. It was the first time I'd seen Wendy since she left to go to her sister's slash mother's house. Wendy looked like hell, bloodshot eyes, dark bags underneath, tear-streaked makeup, the skin on her neck covered in hives. I looked at her and felt nothing. More on that later. The second she saw me, Wendy blurted out that she was sorry for everything, that she loved me, that she couldn't live without me, that this was all a mistake, all the standard garbage. She tried to hug me, but Gail inserted herself between us and told Todd to remind Wendy that she is not to speak directly to me or Gail, that she is to talk to Todd, who will talk to Gail, who will talk to me. Gail had told me to say nothing and keep a blank expression on my face. I thought this would be hard since I've been worrying about if my initial anger would return, but it didn't. I was still numb, kind of in daze, like an out-of-body experience. Todd asked about reconciliation. Gail made it clear that we were there to review the separation agreement, nothing else. Wendy yelled at me that we've been married for five years, and I shouldn't throw it all away over a mistake. Gail reminded Todd that Wendy was not to speak to me directly. Todd whispered something to Wendy, and she momentarily got control of herself again. Gail and Todd began discussing the separation agreement that she'd emailed him. Todd said he did but didn't think it was fair to Wendy. He tried to nitpick, likely to show Wendy he was doing something to earn his fee. But Gail knocked down every argument he made until he admitted that it was as fair as the law requires. When he said that none of this is fair because this is all a mistake, Gail spread black and white printouts across the table of all the pictures from the flash drive with Wendy kissing slash hugging Bob where her engagement ring is clearly visible. Gail circled the ring in each picture with a big fat dark red marker. Alpha moved by the way, asking Todd each time, does your client believe this was a mistake? How about this? Was this a mistake? No. What about this one? Wendy collapsed back into her chair to ugly cry. Gail and Todd began discussing timelines for the delivery of a signed settlement agreement and other matters going forward. I guess my silent indifference finally got to Wendy because, completely unprompted, she screamed out that she never cheated during the marriage. Gail wasn't having it and told Todd, tell your client to give me her cell phone. If your client hasn't cheated during the marriage, then she won't have a problem with my guy copying everything on it and downloading everything in any online account she's logged into. I could have him here in 10 minutes. Wendy clutched her cell phone with both hands, refusing to hand it over. Todd whispered something to Wendy. I'm certain he told her she just admitted to cheating. Two more sobbing. I smiled underneath my mask but said nothing. At this point, I felt sorry for Todd. Call it professional empathy. I've been in his shoes before, you know. You got a loser case with a loser client. The other attorney is 1982-1986 to 1986 Wayne Gretzky, and you're a second-string high school goalie with a slow glove hand. Basically, you just want the beating to end. When the meeting was over, I left without saying a word to Wendy. What's the use? Every word out of her mouth is going to be a lie. Gail received the signed separation agreement yesterday afternoon. I thought I'd be on the hook for the rent until June, if only to protect my own credit. But instead, we're going to equally divide the home down payment savings account. This was the care to get Wendy to sign the separation agreement so quickly. Wendy will pay the rent herself starting this month, along with all utilities, etc. between housing costs and her school costs. She'll have a little money left over, enough to move to a new place. Apparently, Wendy thinks this was a win for her but it's a tactical move that eliminates the one significant asset we had. Divorce now will be much easier. Gail is preparing a petition for an uncontested divorce, so we won't even have to go to court. Here's the best news. Turns out that while we were in our fifth year of marriage, we haven't been married for a full five years. Four years and seven months. In our state, if the marriage is less than five full years, then the family court typically seeks rescission, a concept borrowed from contract law. This means the court will put the parties back in the financial position they were in before the agreement or, in our case, before the marriage. Immediately before our marriage, I was a jobless, heavily indebted law school graduate waiting on my bar results, while Wendy was a full-time gainfully employed teacher with no real property, no children, or account full of money, a teaching credential, a graduate degree in hand, and soon a doctoral degree to go with it. Wendy can't make the argument that rescission isn't appropriate in this case. In short, no alimony. 
Gail did warn Todd that if Wendy contests the divorce, the first person she'll depose will be Bob. Todd replied that Wendy agreed not to contest the divorce. If all goes well, three months from now, I will be putting this sad chapter of my life behind me. I still feel nothing for Wendy, but that no longer scares me. The Redditor who said it was because the Wendy I dated slash married never existed was right. You, sir, are wise. The Wendy I dated, fell in love with, and married never existed. The person who cheated on me and lied to me is a stranger. Our entire relationship was all a lie, an elaborate plan be illusion that benefited her at my expense. I think my mindset also has to do with my first real job between college and law school. When I worked in commission sales, there was a phrase drilled into our heads. You have to get through a lot of no's to get one yes, so don't worry about the no's. Don't waste your time and effort on them, and you'll find your yes is a lot faster and easier. When he was a no, and I wasted too much time and effort on her already. So, no more. Friends, family, and co-workers have noted that my smile is back, and to be honest, I feel better than I have in years. But just to be on the safe side, I have scheduled a few phone-slash-video appointments with a therapist. We'll see how that goes. This will likely be my last update. Thank all of you again for your support and wisdom. If I can repay your excellent advice with some of my own. If your spouse cheats on you, talk to a lawyer as quickly as possible, and then listen to what your lawyer tells you to do. And that's it for this video, guys. If you have thoughts to share, leave a comment below. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you like this content. I'll catch you in the next one. Good day, everyone.